Welcome back to yet another episode of the Just Us Podcast. For now, it'll just be me and Tops26. Hello. And today we'll be taking a look at three subject matters this time, which are the Zack Snyder Dawn of the Dead movie, Beast Wars Transformers, <laughs> and the rest of the Power Rangers Dino Fury season up until the recent mid-season finale. Now, let's go over the more interesting thing. Well, tied interesting thing, if you count Beast Wars, with... Dawn of the Dead. Now, this has been the first ever cinematic debut of Zack Snyder, who is no stranger to this show, specifically because we've pretty much talked about him with the prior DC movies that were from the DC Extended Universe, now the Snyderverse. He's been given some spotlight with his movie Sucker Punch. We have upcoming reviews for films like 300, as well as Watchmen and Army of the Dead, as well as potentially the classic, underrated, and unique Legends of the Guardians. But how does Dawn of the Dead hold up? Um, so the movie's visually, obviously, the oldest one from Zack Snyder. So you don't see him using all his techniques besides the budget is lower. But I think that it's a great start, like a r- great debut. Um, I don't know how much can we talk about it without saying that it's just such a great movie in the genre itself. I don't know if a movie by its own, but inside the zombie genre, which isn't the most privileged one, it is very good. Honestly, though, I can definitely see this as a great way to start getting into a directorial debut simply because like the zombie genre is pretty basic and there are so many ways to build off of it on your own terms without trying to like trump the other or try and retroactively change the story of another one in terms of continuity because Mm -hmm. this dawn of the dead is different from the prior ones or one if there's only other one either way i absolutely like it yeah, me as well. Um, I, I think it's not fair to compare it to any other Zack Snyder movie. It's the one to analyze by its own. Um, and it has so many interesting topics and scenes inside of it and um, direction decisions that are just, I don't know, they, they are worth taking some notes from sometimes. What do you think about that? Yeah. And honestly, considering how this is meant to be like a brand new take on the concept of Dawn of the Dead that the uh, George Romero film had back in 1978, like this film definitely feels yeah. like it's not trying to replace the other film. It's basically this is another director's take on the idea because you can always go back and visit the other one. It's not like they re- replaced it, film critics. Journals, verified. And generally speaking, I like the way the setting is because you pretty much have a much more uh, threatening feel for the zombies. Maybe not on the same level that Army of the Dead is going to have with their much smarter zombies. And on top of the fact that one of them looks like Wonder Woman and there's a tiger. But either way, this is definitely a sign that. There's a lot you can build off of with the zombie genre while either being a remake of sorts or just adding on to the concept itself. Like the baby, like the baby zombie. Now we have a tiger zombie, but back then we had a baby zombie. Yeah, it's that's just kind of like one holy shitload of fuck situation right there. <laughs> and also, I, I didn't actually get... I didn't understand that well, the way they killed each other, and then the fucking baby zombie appeared and started yelling and crying. Yeah, it's very just disturbing way. One of those things that, like, we, like, I'm pretty sure some would say, like, oh, this is something Zack Snyder would do and try and go to some sort of vague pseudo intellectualist rant about babies in films, but it's just proof that zombies are fucked up no matter what they are. Yeah, it's a very realistic take because 
I think none of them survive if you see like that last tape. But either way, um, it is also realistic because people are constantly dying. There, there, there are no Deus Ex Machinas. There are no uh, last minute salvations. The, the y'all there is somehow no happy ending. suffer, or, or I don't know. Yeah, there's pretty much no happy ending in sight. No, and that's fine because for something like this, it pretty much leaves you up to debate on whether or not they did survive. And considering the fact that this is a zombie outbreak we're talking about, there is a chance that they did not. Mm-hmm. And it's a big chance as well. Because, well, they're not on the same level, like I said, on the new zombies we're going to see in Army of the Dead. They still have that sort of threat to them that makes you want to run away as fast as you can. But even then, no matter where you go, you're always going to be dead. Exactly. I had to say that the characters themselves are also pretty good in terms of the ones that are trying to go up against the zombies or at least try and survive. You pretty much have like a, a nice group of characters that have different backgrounds and they're all... Yeah, the, like, the beginning already is hallucinating. Like You, you have the, the nurse who arrives home and then the outbreak happens and one of the first ones to go down is the fucking his, uh, husband. And you feel so much tension. And then you f- you see all the fucking zombies all around. And it's constant danger all, all the time. Yeah, there's also like... There, it pretty much feels like there's no time to breathe and relax. Because no. every time you go somewhere to hide, there's always either another zombie that's going to approach you or they're coming at you with brute force of some kind. Mm-hmm. And even shows just how, like, prepared they were to show off the dangers of zombies in the modern day filming. Because, like, the zombie concept can be very basic. And, well, there have been some films that know how to change things up. I think this is one of the first that managed to make the genre feel a little more refreshing in a way. Yeah, I agree. And you you have to remember that it was previous to The Walking Dead, previous to the genre of maybe having its biggest jump. So I think Zack Snyder made a, a step while doing this movie. Um, also, the cast is very good, but unknown. Like, they're, they're not very known. <laughs> Pretty much not. And another, another another detail is that James Gunn wrote the script. Yeah, I, I remember when people were pretty much saying stuff like, "Oh, why would you try and go up against these two? Like they're both best friends." Just because they're both best friends, or best friends, best friends. Uh oh, that sounds like a James <laughs> Gunn tweet. Just because friends. Just because they're both friends in some way doesn't mean I have to like Gun. Because like Snyder himself looks like a much like like the opposite of how people would see him as. They see him as this big threat, this bully, this jerk, this prick, but in reality, he's a really nice guy. Whereas you look at James Gunn and they pretty much worship him as a sort of uh like this groundbreaking individual. And in reality, he's kind of like a questionable individual, if you ask me. He should be more controversial than Zack. That's something I'm very sure about. Yeah. And considering the fact that we got stuff like the controversy of his tweets, which I'm pretty sure some people are probably lolling at just because they think it's uh, like not worth branting about just because it's trying to make him look bad or they think we have to move on. But it is kind of amusing how people would try to defend him when that happened. I remember some verified yeah. said, well, if we're going to call him a pedophile, then I am a proud pedophile. And people don't take that out of context. I swear to God. You fucking do. But yeah. Pretty much definitely shows the hypocrisies that people have. And while we don't exactly know if James Gunn actually did anything bad like that, uh, I still don't really like him nonetheless just because of how just because, like, the vibes that he has. I really don't want to be around him, if I'm being honest. That being said, though, 
Dawn of the Dead is a great way to start off the cinematic debut of Zack Snyder as a film director. And in some ways, I have to say that this film might seem a little dated compared to the concepts that we got from the other films. I mean, we had like a big, like uh, ancient time period films in the past, but not in the same level as 300. And then you look at stuff like Watchmen, which is a very unique comic book movie just because of its commentary, as well as the fact that it has a unique property that's somehow still familiar. I mean, you look at stuff like The Shadow and uh, Sin City, and those films do have some sort of familiarity, but not on the same level that something like Watchmen has, where it's niche, but not that niche. And of course, you go to Sucker Punch, which has some notoriety, but still does a better message than most films have when it comes to girl power. And we have the very familiar DC films that he's done for Man of Steel, Batman v Superman, and his Snyder Cut. So you can say that Dawn of the Dead does feel a little more basic and limited compared to what we got nowadays with Zack specifically, but I can't fault him because yeah. it is a great way to delve into the film. And honestly, at least it doesn't feel like a massive shift in quality, nor does it feel like a massive, like a difference in writing. It's just that this was a simpler film to work with, but not like it aged like milk compared to certain other films that were made at a time period compared to their subsequent offerings. Yeah. I, I I agree. I think the key word there is that Zach is limited. He usually works with very big budgets, and here they probably have some prearranged limits for him to not go all out. And you know how Zach, when he's not unleashed, he's not the best Zach. <laughs> but still, the movie does very good points to be even valued around. Um, the fan base of zombie genre itself. I, I always hear a lot of praise for the movie. I think also criticism itself wasn't bad. It was actually good. Yeah. Not that I not that I care too much about it, but it, it, it was pretty positive at first. Which was the next movie following this one from Zach? Three hundred. Okay. So yeah. He, he's a fucking badass. <laughs> Without a shadow of a doubt. And going on to your comment on the way people reviewed the film back then, that kind of makes me miss a time when there was no like ugly-ass nerd culture trying to dictate what films should and shouldn't be. I mean, like, we, like the genuine concerns are just, like, maybe there's not much rewatch value. Maybe, like, the, uh, like, there's not much to think about or reflect on if there's too much action in the movie or it's just a budget suck, the performances were bad, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Whereas nowadays mm -hmm. we're pretty much uh, like flatuated with with garbage complaints like comic inaccuracy or the way things are done and the like. It's just pathetic when it comes to film criticism now compared to back then. Yeah, I see that a lot. And nothing. And we're talking about we're talking about two thousand and four. Yeah. So we only had we only had like blogs, let's say. So if you wanted to read a, a, a criticism from someone outside from the elite, you would have probably someone going crazy and loving it. Nowadays, it's so open to everyone that people like to shit and throw hate and be toxic because it's. For them, maybe it's cool. But the worst thing about it is just the fact that, like, back then there was layers to genuine criticism. There was no agenda. There was no, like, uh, stupid-ass complaints. It was all just, this is what I like about the movie. This is what I didn't like. Here's how to rate it. Whereas nowadays, when you look at an article, like, uh, on like, um, like, compare an article on 300 back then to now, an article on 300 would probably say, like, this is a great film to watch, although some might find the, uh, Rewatch Valley the Limited, or they might not be that impressed with the storytelling unless they watch the film more and more. Whereas nowadays, you pretty much be like, this film reminds me too much of like the alt-right invasion that happened in Charlottesville. I am an intelligent person. <laughs> Someone please give me likes and retweets because I am pro-everything. Like, shut up. So, yeah. 
<laughs> that's basically nowadays. But th back then, it, it was cool. Yeah, and, and you actually valued and gave some importance to those reviews. And you could see that it, it was uh, exclusive to some people and they kind of enjoyed doing it because they knew that it wasn't going to have a lot of repercussion. So while they did it, they also enjoy, enjoyed it. Nowadays, they sound like gatekeepers, like Zack said and plenty of others. Pretty much. As well as the fact that they like to ruin the fun when it comes to stupid complaints as well as acting like they care but only just want the brownie points and other crap that they deserve to be called out on. But yeah, Dawn of the Dead, a good movie to work with. A good movie to enjoy, and it makes me even more excited for Army of the Dead. Oh yeah, but yeah. Army of Army of the Dead is Zack unleashed. Here he comes, baby. Now I'm pretty sure some people might be wondering, why are you going to watch Army of the Dead if you said you're against Netflix for having cuties on? In this case, much like how we got HBO Max for the sake of supporting Zack, I would probably get into the Netflix shit just to support Zack. I'm not going to support that garble film, nor would I support the Netflix company as a whole. Main priority is the Zack attack. Zack attack. Yeah, that sounds really cool the way you said it. Zack attack. Zack attack. <coughs> oh, talking about Zack attacks and that Mortal Kombat. <laughs> oh, oh, God. <laughs> no, part no of me that's not a topic for today. <laughs> Okay, real quick. Part of me wanted to review Mortal Kombat back when we came up with an idea of having this episode be four subject matters, but the more I thought about it, let's move on. <laughs> yeah. So next up, we'll be talking about another thing from the 90s, that being Beast Wars. Now, the average Transformers person would know Beast Wars as the big franchise that helped save the series back when Generation 2 failed on toy sales by giving us a brand new cartoon Wild takes on the concept of Transformers and characters that people grew to love. But some of the ordinary G1 fans or the average nerd site that tries to act like they're big fans you only know about Generation 1 and Michael Bay would probably dismiss Beast Wars as some stupid CGI cartoon that only got good just because it had the classic characters. But what do I think about it as someone that grew up with Transformers in the 2000s? Well. Let's dive in. So, Beast Wars begins with the Maximals and Predacons crashing in prehistoric Earth. As we always expect when it comes to the franchise when they go on different planets. And at first glance, it starts off as a very basic series. You know, it's pretty much a different take on the whole Autobots wage of battle, blah 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 stuff towards the Decepticons. But it pretty much has a much smaller cast. It, the show is entirely CGI. And while some would say that it reeks too much of the 90s, it actually holds up a lot better story-wise than people would give credit to. But let's talk about the story itself. Initially, it begins with stuff like the characters just doing their average fights. It is fairly episodic. But that being said, I do like the fact that we get more characters to build up the cast. And concerning the fact that Beast Wars had fewer Transformers than Generation 1 did, it was so refreshing to have like a slow build-up. So in one episode, you'd be introduced to Tigatron, another one, Inferno, and so on and so forth. And even if they brought in more than one character in a new episode, it didn't feel like they were a sudden like blockade words of characters. It was just little by little and proper development. And we'll get to the characters in a bit, but adding on to the story, things got a little more complicated when we got stuff like the Vok, who showed up and were angry at the two factions for ruining their experiments with the planet Earth. Now they were said to destroy the planet, which required Optimus Primal to try and destroy the planet buster, until he ended up getting blown up within it once it was destroyed. But before then, we had some of the more interesting storylines, such as Rhinox becoming a Predacon by the power of reprogramming done by Megatron. Starscream is returning into the series, possessing Waspinator. 
Optimus Primal losing his own mind after being stung by a cyber bee by Scorponok. And stuff like that is pretty much what we mostly get with Beast Wars Season 1. Where it's all just characters that were doing episodic stuff, but at least it was interesting episodic stuff. More than just uh, power sources and the like. They definitely gave attention to specific characters, especially the Maximals. Hell, even the first episode wasn't just the characters get their mows and start shooting each other. Dinobot, as we'll get into in a bit, left the Predacons because he didn't like the way they worked and initially met up with the Maximals and fought Primal before deciding, you know what, I like your style, Primal. I'd rather be with your team than the Predacons. And with season two, with season two, we pretty much get into stuff like the Maximals having no faith or little faith whatsoever with uh, the loss of their leader. They get the transmittal form. Some characters are left behind in parts of the Earth. Others are dead. And with the arrival of the Fusors and time with the transmittal powers, things got kind of crazy for both factions when they started fighting against each other until Optimus Primal arrived and saved the day. And from there, we got slowly, we got slower arcs that build up to stuff like Black Arachnia confessing her feelings towards Silverbolt, or uh, Cheetor pretty much getting into the team more as a maturing character. We also have stuff like the struggles that Dinobot has as a former Predacon, seeing that he might try and find a way to change the war, find his own purpose. And he does so at the end when he gets himself killed, sacrificing the last of his power to destroy one of the golden discs, preventing Megatron from ruling history. Okay, wow. It it sounds far more complicated and complex than I thought about. Uh, it, It actually sounds like it had everything. Like it had romance and it had character evolution and it had betrayals. Yeah. I'm actually surprised. And there's even one episode that talk that puts like both factions in like the same level. There's an episode that has Transmutate, who is a malfunctioning protoform that has no form, has no beauty. It looks like a basic CGI character with wires on it and sounds feminine. But it has a bit of compassion and a lot of raw power that is hard for it to control at times. And both the Maximals and Predacons want her. The Maximals want to use her and try and repair her, while the Predacons want to use her as a weapon. But both end up getting her killed when she wants to stop uh, Silverbolt and Rampage from fighting over her. Hmm. Yeah. So, like, what what I can see is that, of course, like all animations from the 90s, it looks outdated but maybe they had like a very good concept and idea behind it all that made this series sort of turn into what the term would be classic between animation could you say that yeah and i'm pretty sure most people would immediately think of something like batman the animated series for something like that but i think beast wars knows how to do it better simply by the virtue of characters that build up over time in terms of their roles. Mm-hmm. I already mentioned Dinobot, but going back to the story, uh, it turns out that Beast Wars is actually a prequel of sorts as well as a sequel to Generation 1. Now, I myself am not oh. a big G1 fan these days. I kind of get like annoyed by it, seeing how overrated it's become. But back then, like when I discovered Beast Wars, I was surprised that it was connected to a cartoon that... Uh, people liked and part of me thought oh like oh, like well people only, only like Beast Wars because it connected to G1 but in retrospect if I think it's great that it has some sort of connectivity because not only was it a standalone cartoon for people to enjoy but it was also a way to continue off the uh, story that G1 has by showing off these characters that would affect the future as it turns out one of the char- Decepti- one of the decepticons ravage shows up and t- 
tells Megatron that he needs to reveal what he's doing. And Megatron says that he's following the instructions of his ancestor, the original Megatron, the gun, sometimes tank. And Ooh. what he's going to do is pretty much go back in time and get Optimus Prime killed while he's in stasis lock, ensuring that the Decepticons are victorious. And like the fact that we go from the characters... Wait. Can I just ask you one thing? It it does it like sort of kind of work like uh, the the new Planet of the Apes trilogy because you said it's like a prequel but also a, like a sequel. Yeah, it, it, can, it can kind of be like that, but more importantly, it pretty much has a priority as putting these sorts of characters in a surprise story because at first you might think that it's just a regular battle between two factions, but it turns out that these factions are the descendants of the original Autobots and Decepticons. On top of that, we have the characters that are pretty much like having a new mission, that being to protect the Ark from further damage done by the Predacons. As at one point during the season two finale, when Megatron destroys Optimus Prime's head, the Maximals start like getting injured or starting to feel pain from the like the time capsule itself being messed up badly, resulting in their form shifting between season one and season two. And they immediately had to repair Optimus's head. Well, on the consequence, having Optimus Primal become the new like bearer of Prime Spark for a little bit, giving him a new form. And from there we get stuff like the Maximals protecting the Ark. We have Death Charge as a character that's going to have his revenge against a Predacon named Rampage. Black Arachnia becomes a full-on Maximal, as well as losing any trace of a Predacon programming. Cheetor becomes a much older character. And like it's all very good in terms of storytelling. So it it like its biggest focus is storytelling. Yeah, as well as the characters. And let me tell you that I'm just happy that in retrospect that there's fewer characters at first than Generation One because, all right, Generation One had 18 Autobots and 11 Decepticons. That's a lot. Huh. And in Season Two, the amount <laughs> multiplied. So we pretty much have like around 40 Autobots and around 27 Decepticons, give or take. I lost track. Whoa. How do you handle the, the, that many characters? Well, it's simple. You just promote them as the newest toys and hope that kids uh-huh. buy them because they're, of course they would, since they're going to be like, Mommy, 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 I want that Bruticus. You just had a Defensor, honey. I want that toy, damn it. <laughs> Like, Beast Wars, in a way, is still a toy commercial by having the characters focused as your typical, like, uh, here's a new character, buy its toy. But it's more than that. You know, like, Airazor has a personality. She's more than just, like, uh, like when he, okay, let me just get into the characters. I'm already jumping in too soon. So, like, we have the main five Maximals and we have the main five Predacons. I'll go over them at the best brief of my ability, if that made sense. Optimus Primal is a gorilla. He is a descendant of Optimus Prime. He's more father-like than regular Prime. And he's also very like uh, colorful with his own catchphrases. Like he says, that's just Prime. And occasionally would say, shut up, Rat Trap. But yeah, he's got uh, more personality than I'd say compared to Generation 1 Optimus. And like... uh, I also like the fact he's more of a down-to-earth guy and took a lot of inspiration from his ancestor while even doing more than what he has done. Like, he saved not just his ancestor, but also saved the entire future. Damn. Real hero. Yeah, and that's something that a lot of fiction tries to do when they retcon that, like, a new character 
doing like being totally superior to an older character. Like look at Star Wars when they try to like upsell a brand new character by saying, "Oh, Yoda is a failure. Like this new character is totally better than him. Please buy him, or else we're gonna call you alt right like fuckers, Star Wars fans, or sexist, or yeah. whatever." <laughs> Whatever stupid crap that people try to say, regardless of the kind of Star Wars fan they're talking to. But Beast Wars knows how to write a new character with respect by having them feel like they're important while trying not to make the original guy feel like a failure by comparison. It's just that Optimus Prime did a lot, but Optimus Primal did even more. That's... That's actually crazy to hear. Yeah. But Op Optimus Primal sounds like a cool dude. Yeah. And of course, we have some even like just as cool Maximal friends. We have Cheetor, who is kind of like the uh, young guy. He's a punk. He's kind of an impulsive one, but his character does develop over time as he starts to feel a little more uh, part of the team beyond just being the punk. He matures like he has a huge soft spot for optimus primal like he looks up to him he sort of sees him like as a father figure of sorts and the two have very good chemistry overall cheeto might make some impulsive decisions in the first season but he grows in being a much more capable character over time and it even helps when things get a lot of uh out of heat especially at the time he became a transmetal two where you could say it's like puberty in a way but well, even Rattrap said it, but it allows him to further delve into these sort of serious situations, knowing how to be more in control of what you can do, as well as feeling more on the same page that Primal and everyone else is. Yeah. We have Rhinox, who's like the smart guy. I mean, I, I like the fact that Rhinox isn't just some sort of big brute. He's intelligent but he's also strong at the same time. He's a scientist. He knows how to do the repairs of the ships. He made this like the, the, the defense computer, the Sentinel, for the Axelon ship. And <clears throat> while he's been mostly the same throughout the entire season as he is a organic rhino, Rhinox is still a great character nonetheless. Although some people might know him best for either becoming a Predacon thanks to Megatron's reprogramming, Seizing a lot and then eating some beans to make a massive fart attack on the Predacons just once. Or, like, uh, being able to revive Primal as well as bringing life to Maximal Protoform Air Razor. And we have the fourth member of the Maximals, Rat Trap. He's sardonic. He's sarcastic. He has an attitude. And kind of a coward as well. I mean, there's moments where he goes like, you know, you're kind of a... Kind of like, uh, you're up, heads up in the clouds, Cheetor. Then he goes, we're all gonna die. Like, it's funny, too. Like, sometimes he wants to be into the action. He likes to blow stuff up, but he doesn't want to get blown up. But he's enjoyable to watch. I like his personality, and I especially like the friendship he has with the likes of Rhinox as well as Dinobot. The two don't really share much chemistry with each other, but Dinobot grows to appreciate him, and so does Rat Trap. It's especially sad when the two say their farewells in the final episode that has the original Dinobot. And speaking um, of, Dinobot himself, I think, is the best thing in Transformers to use that word or name or term. Because unlike the G1 Dinobots, unlike the animated Dinobots, unlike the Age of Extinction Dinobots, Di Beast Wars Dinobot is just like the best guy ever. Because he's got a unique personality. He's this poetic Shakespearean character. He's a noble warrior. He's not some sort of Grimlock wannabe. He's got his own identity. He doesn't see himself as a true Maximal, yet prefers their ideologies over the Predacons. In some ways, he's got a bit of like uh, trust and appreciation towards the Maximals, especially Primal. And he understands the fact that... in in times of crisis, he knows that sacrifice will be the only way to get victory. As we learned later on in 2007, no sacrifice, no victory. Damn. That, that sounds sort of sad. 
he returned in the form that's more of like a uh, Frankenstein clone, Dinobot 2, where he shares a spark with Rampage. And this is kind of weird to say, but Dinobot 2 doesn't really feel as important to the show as regular Dinobot did until he got his memories back at the finale, where he turned against Megatron and like triggered him by saying the H word, honor. But... I guess that might have been because there was like a lost episode that didn't get filmed properly, that didn't get filmed or was not like put in production because of how dark it was. Basically, Ratchup tried to revive the original Dinobots' memories but failed to do so. So it, it, it has like one last chapter that it's lost? Like one episode that was lost. There were like three episodes that were unproduced. Uh, there was. Bitch Wars, there was A Greater Ape, and there was Dark Glass. Bitch Wars was pretty much like Black Arachne and Eraser becoming their own girl power faction, but uh, they lost interest in writing it. A Greater Ape was pretty much a story where Optimus Primal thinks he's like a real ape and uh, lives with a bunch of apes until he gets his memory back. And the more interesting one, Dark Glass, is pretty much Cheetor trying to get his old friend back. Although he accepts that he might not be able to find Dinobot back into his old self again. Okay. These other Maximals aren't as prominent as they are, so I'll just go over them briefly. Uh, Airazor was cool to see, although she did become a sort of like a background character. Although she's more known for hanging out with Tigatron, who sort of looks like Cheetor, but is bigger, beefier, and is a white tiger and not a cheetah. Now, Tigatron is pretty much just like a noble sort of guy. He's like much older than Cheetor. He's much more experienced and also has a bit of like a, I don't want to say samurai feel to him, but he's more like samurai Jack in a way in terms of his behavior, if that makes sense. Cool. The two of them share like a bond with each other, although it's kind of funny to think about what their child would be like. A falcon and a tiger baby mix. I don't know. Well, they sort of had one when they were revived as Tiger Hawk, but they didn't last long. The guy got was around for like a few episodes and then got killed by Megatron in the season finale or the series finale. <laughs> Next, so Maximum. You're not afraid of killing. Yeah, definitely. As we already mentioned, with Dinobot sacrificing himself twice. Yeah. And, of course, yeah. Optimus Primal and G1 Optimus Prime. Now we have Silverbolt, who's not to be confused with the Generation 1 aerial bot. This Silverbolt's kind of like 60s Batman with his uh, superheroic personality that would kind of make Adam West blush. As well as having a crush <laughs> on Black Arachnia. He's like, my beautiful dark poison heart. I would do anything to keep you away from the Predacons. <laughs> yeah, he's kind of funny to watch, although I think people mostly remember him for the fact that he has a crush on Black Arachnia. And there's also Death Charge, who has revenge against Rampage, but shows up in near the end of the series and is mostly known for that. Cool guy, but not as memorable as someone like Dinobot or Silverbolt, if we're being honest. Damn, cool. But he's a fish former, so, nonetheless. Oh, it's an aquatic. Yeah, he's a manta one. ray. Nice. Yep. And now with the Predacons, Megatron is just my favorite version of the character. I, I like his design, but more importantly, I like his like personality. I like how he plans stuff out. He's less Saturday morning cartoon than his ancestor. He's very theatrical. He has a lot of uh, life put into him, especially when he goes around saying yes towards the uh, towards his enemies as well as his own allies. And he's just so fun to watch, especially when you consider the fact that uh, he's more than just an ordinary villain. And he learned a lot from the mistakes that his Generation 1 ancestor did. For example, he knows how to say yes properly. Whereas original Megatron was just super raspy and kind of uh, obsessed with weapons that look stupid. 
So despite the old CG, they look very alive. That's what you're saying? Yeah. Especially Megatron? Yeah, especially Megatron. Like, there's so much personality put into him. I especially like seeing when he laughs, like, <laughs> or when he's brushing the teeth of his dino head, or when he's pointing at his enemies, especially when he tells um, Optimus Prime that he no longer exists after wiping out his head. And damn. Yeah, it's just pretty good Megatron, like my favorite Megatron by far. It was even cool to see him take over his ancestor Spark and become a transmetal to himself. Okay. Next Predacon is Waspinator, who initially starts off as being a threat as he was able to take down Cheetor nor problem. But it wasn't until Rhinox shot him down with his uh, chain guns of doom where Waspinator became a whipping boy. Every time he gets heavily injured or blown up or shot down or sliced up, Waspinator comes back perfectly fine. And it's pretty much a kind of like, uh, no, Waspinator, hated by the universe, Aww. sort of guy. <laughs> and, I like, and I love seeing him on the show because it's always sort of satisfying to see him become a punching bag. And he's aware of it as well. And the main reason is because, like, the way he writes. He sounds insecty. He sounds sort of weird. So the writers didn't want to have Scott McNeil do the voice for him all the time. So they pretty much were able to write him out in a clever way by having him survive being injured, but would have to return one way or another after getting blown to bits and the like. Uh, yeah, so also, from what I understand, the voice acting gives it a very good vibe to it all. Yeah, like Optimus Primal cool. sounds like a, a more fatherly take on the leadership role. Cheetor's like young and fresh, Rhinox is smart, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. They have their personalities very accentuated. Yeah, that's what I like about him. And even Scott McNeil, despite voicing like four to five characters, knew how to diversify their voices. Like Rat Trap sounds like uh sardonic, Dinobot sounds like uh like a very raspy sort of character. Waspinator is very bug-like and Silverbolt is very uh, heroic. That's how you do good voice work. And I think that's like something that cartoons don't do these days. I mean, if you were to watch this and then watch the War for Cybertron Netflix stuff, you see a major difference in the way the voice performances are. It feels like a downgrade if you ask me to go from Beast Wars to Netflix yeah, what I always thought in animation is that it's better to first do the voice acting and define a personality and then do the animation itself. Yeah. And that's something we don't get these days. And no. I kind of and I'm honestly worried that by the fact that War for Cybertron is gonna write down these characters as the same sort of guy, like Rat Trap could sound like Bumblebee or Mirage. Optimus Primal could sort of sound like Optimus Prime. I, I'm not like I don't really want to hear these characters have these inferior voices because like Transformers as a whole, one of the things I like is that every voice sounds distinct from one another. There's so much creativity. And it's just a shame that you get stuff like uh War for Cybertron Netflix and the Japanese dubs, like the Japanese G1 anime dubs for Omni Productions, where they sound like shit. <laughs> But Beast Wars is good. And of course we have stuff like Scorponok. He's kind of a clumsy guy. He gets killed in Season 2. Uh, Pterosaur, sort of like the Starscream guy. He gets killed in Season 2. He's best known for taking over the power of the Energon. Since in the show, Transformers, because they're much smaller, can't rely on Energon absorption. Because if they get a lot of Energon absorption, then they're going to like suffer because it's, it's an overload. I see. Yeah, like it's something that Generation 1 Transformers don't have because they're bigger. And as a compromise, the Beast Wars characters had to scan Beast modes that are organic so they would survive any sort of Energon radiation. Oh. So it's kind of dangerous, dangerous or life-threatening? Yeah, it's life-threatening if there's like too much to absorb. Okay. 
but thankfully they're smart enough to use the beast modes, which is the first time we ever got proper organic beast modes for Transformers. How are those tr transitions between the, um, the robot form to the beast form, the beast mode? Well, before we go into the other character, Tarantulas, I'll, I'll explain that uh, Beast Wars has the characters transform like how they normally would. But they huh. like the robot mode still wear parts of the beast modes, yet they treat them like armor in a way. So you have Cheetor, who pretty much still has a like a cheetah head that's on his chest, as most like feline transformers do. Uh, Optimus Primal is unique. Like sure, he's a primate that turns into a primate sort of guy, but his shoulders flip up to become shoulder pads. The waist swivels to give him like uh, different legs. And the gorilla head she was becomes the first monkey. Yeah, and the gorilla head. <laughs> Actually, no, the first one was ape face, but people prefer Optimus Primal because he's more iconic. Uh -huh. But yeah, Primal is like a unique transformation with the the uh, gorilla chest, like falling inside out to become like a unique sort of chest design that sort of resembles a matrix. Oh, interesting. And Megatron's transformation is the craziest, with the uh, dino head becoming the right arm, and the uh, back of the dinosaur, the tail, becoming the left arm. You probably got the best toys out of this show. Yeah, and honestly, I like to talk about the toys, but you definitely had a lot of fun stuff with it. The only thing I wouldn't like like about the series is the fact that you had Gold Plastic Syndrome. On some characters like Megatron in his transmittal form. Yeah. But yeah, definitely great stuff. Mm -hmm. Very crazy, very experimentative, but still great nonetheless. And there's Tarantulus, who is pretty much a mad scientist. He's crazy, he's psychotic, and he even turned out to have been like a traitor amongst the Predacons. Seeing as he like helped Ravage cope against Megatron. And eventually got killed by Tiger Hawk for being involved with the Vok. Okay. And that's pretty much like the uh, core five. We have Inferno, who's a fire ant. He loves to burn stuff. He's obsessed with the Predacon faction. He calls Megatron his queen, much to the Predacon leader's dismay. And he goes from sounding threatening to sounding more... Uh, more of an accent that would fit in well with uh, Lord Farquaad's kingdom. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and now we have Black Arachnia, another, uh, well, I wouldn't call I, we would probably call her a bug, but not an insect. She's a Black Widow spider. She's a great female villain. She's, like, she's more than just, like, uh, an attractive looking Predacon. She's pretty much a swift, sleek, Femme Fatale, she was able to do a spin attack on Dinobot when he was frozen in his dino mode and kept on kicking his head until he was knocked over. She's sneaky. She knows how to get the most out of her allies as well as the Maximals by manipulating them. And she was great to watch, especially when she was trying to like uh, hide the fact that she has a crush on Silverbolt. Okay. It was also great to see her become a uh, Maximal near the end of the series as she was originally a Maximal, but the Predacons took her protoform and turned her into a Predacon. She's still a spider, though, but I have to say that's kind of crazy that she went from sort of like a like one style of, uh, of attractive female design to another one with huh. like the thing people like the average person would think that she's got big boobs. But what I like about her is the fact that her spider legs can become guns. Oh, why why didn't his her tits become guns? That would be too much, honestly. That'd be kind That's of That's a lost opportunity. Although actually Generation One Starscream did that once. <laughs> yeah, I think I've seen a an image of me. Yeah. <laughs> but uh that's like yeah like the fact that she and and uh tarantulas can turn their spider legs into eight guns is crazy as hell and i love it and 
Speaking of Starscream, before we go into the season two, guys, like he showed up. He was the only Generation One character aside from Ravage and I guess Megatron, the original, to have any speaking roles. Starscream possesses Waspinator, and he was able to like overthrow the Predacons as well as the Maximals until Black Arachnia and Optimus Primal decided to like outsmart him. Uh-huh. Yeah. And like uh, he was like, Black Arachnia, give me a hand or so. And she pretty much like uh, has him in a trap where he's damaged and is near Energon radiation. And she shoots Starscream, well, who is possessing Waspinator, uh, still possessing him. And uh, Waspinator is free from Starscream's possession. Although Waspinator has headache in his whole body while Starscream spark flights away. Saying, I'll be back. Even if it takes me a thousand years, I'll have a revenge on all of you. <laughs> Classic. Yeah. And that right there is how you bring in an old character without making them feel like the only thing that matters. Because in retrospect, I appreciate that Beast Wars wasn't just trying to dick fry Generation 1. And if it used you one, it used it sparingly and more naturally. So bringing in Starscream as a threat and the character for one episode was good. Uh -huh. And of course with season two Predacons we have Quick Strike, who's pretty much a uh, he's like he's got two heads. He has a scorpion head and he has a cobra head for a tail. Kind of like a cowboy sort of guy. He's demented and he's one of the two fusors along with Silverbolt in the show. But Quick Strike gets killed in the third season, along with Inferno. So you had a lot of character moments. Yeah. And thankfully, there's more character moments per character than Generation 1 offered, where it's pretty much like, okay, this character is going to be focused on because we have a new toy for them. Whereas with Beast Wars, it's like, this is the story, these are the characters, or what the characters are going to do. So, for example, Optimus Primal would tell the Maximals it's time to get into action, while Rat Trap would trick Waspinator in thinking that he's Quick Strike and gives him a bomb that Waspinator like uh, accepts because he's an idiot. While Rat Trap outsmarts him, so it's one of the few Transformers shows that prioritizes another stuff besides the selling, and the merchandising. Yeah, I, I think it's the first one. The first TV show. First one. Yeah. Great. Because when you look at Generation 1, it was pretty much all like, uh, okay, we got to sell all these toys because little Jimmy wants to fill up his toy shelf and potentially break them so he can yeah. have more stuff. Poor Jimmy. And you look at the Japanese sequels of Generation 1, and they're no better. In fact, I think they're worse. Like, they try so hard to shoehorn all these characters in one episode and try and convince, like, uh, Satoshi to buy... Uh, these crap little train bots to go along with uh, the like the somewhat nicer headmasters and try to treat them as like uh, like the best thing ever until the next year where they replace them with the other characters with similar functions. Oh man, at least with <laughs> Beast Wars, when they give in a new character, sure they give him a lot of attention until the next new character, but it's not as mm -hmm. obvious. And when they go into new transmetal forms, at least... Some characters get the transmittal forms, while others don't. Yeah. It's all about balance, baby. And it's kind of weird saying that yeah. to you. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, for a, for a lot of things in life, it's all about balance. So I approve. Yeah. And I think the other Predacon we have to go over is just uh, Rampage. He's a big crab that turns into a tank, and he's also very threatening. Like he was, like he was bragging to Dev Charge about eating his friends in another planet, as well as being a. He's pretty much a serial killer, and the only reason why he's with the Predacons is because Megatron sees him as a threat. Uh -huh. And of course, so... he gets killed off by uh, Dev Charge at the end. No, but Death Charge dies as well. Like 
the resulting like explosion from the stab that Dev charged to, to Rampage got them both killed. So it's a double kill. Yeah. And in terms Mutual of other characters, kill. yeah, and pretty much in terms of other characters, uh, I already covered Dinobot, who became a clone, who had a clone, Dinobot 2. And there's also Ravage, who's just a G1 guy, but with a retooled body of Transmetal Cheetor with a with a cat head on. Not like a uwu uh, Neko cat head, but like a CGI Jaguar head. Uwu, yeah. And he was also like, even like this very... It's very unexpected Russian accent when he talked to Megatron. <laughs> yeah, it was great stuff. And it's also funny That's because... That's not cute enough. And like, it's especially funny considering the fact that Ravage was just a tape cassette <laughs> in Generation 1. So to see him be, get this upgraded body form, independent from Soundwave, his possibly long dead like uh, pet owner, is a great glow up, if you ask me. Cool. But don't worry, at one point he says, Decepticons forever! Turns into a cassette and plays rock music while Megatron laughs in triumph upon shooting the Maximals when they go to the Ark. Oh. And that's a lot of characters, but much fewer than Generation 1, which, thank God. Now, we already mentioned the CGI being a thing, but... I have to say that while CGI in the 90s might be dated, if there's anything to go by with the commercials and the video game graphics, I think Beast Wars is one of those shows that, while not on the same level of CGI quality that something like Toy Story would have, I think it does a very good job with improving over time. Like Character models look much nicer as time goes on. Animations become more and more expressive. The uh, environments look much more natural. It, it, like we go from it, like okay, like I know some people might think old CGI is like Veggie Tales, but look at Generation Two, where it's a little more complex because you're working with robots, you're working with sharp with like harsher edges. And the Generation Two CGI for the introduction and some of the commercials looks rough as hell. Although some of the older commercials got better, but like. If you saw the one video where Optimus Prime was fighting like a Decepticon jet, that looked rough. It looked like a prototype. It looked like something you'd find for like a Sega console instead of a Nintendo 64 one, or if you know what I'm saying. Yeah. And by contrast, I think Beast Wars has like, well, okay, okay of course the CGI is not as good as Transformers Prime. And I'm not going to use the movies as an example because like the movies are different. But Transformers Prime CGI is much richer. It's much smoother. It's much sharper. The action is much nicer. But that doesn't mean Beast Wars is crap because Beast Wars, while dated in terms of CGI quality overall, holds up better than stuff like Energon and Cybertron by having much nicer expressions, much more fluid character movement, and more dynamic fights. Like, in Beast Wars, you can have, like, characters, like, uh, do hand gestures and, like, uh, have different running cycles as well as rely little on, on traditional animation. Whereas when you look at Energon, characters are stiff, their mouths flap, they take turns to animate, like in anime, and they rely so heavily on stock footage as well as having uh, traditional cell animation to try and use him as a crutch it's poor and it's very ironic that a more modern show well modern as far as 2004 and 5 is concerned is inferior to a show made in 1996 yeah yeah i get that and i think we could probably go over one more topic that being about the way it uses generation one stuff now, like back then, like I was pretty much trying to like learn about Transformers and I always like wanted to use Generation 1 as a way for me to try and get approval from like the older fans as a way of like, look, I don't know about this stuff. Can I be in your fan base too? But like when I saw Beast Wars back in 2007 when I was watching like little bits of other stuff on Monkey Bar TV, 
monkey. I, like, didn't really see Beast Wars as a proper Transformer show at, at the time. I thought because of the CGI, because it didn't have the logo at first, I thought it was like Animorphs in a way. Which, Animorphs is definitely more 90s than Beast Wars. If you ask me. Okay. I, I kind of understand that, yeah. But like, when I heard that Beast Wars had like uh, Generation 1 characters in it, that, that piqued my interest more. But when I watched the rest of the series, I, I saw Beast Wars less as this sort of stupid CGI cartoon from the 90s. And more of like this actually very good show. Well, not 100% perfect by today's standards because people are spoiled by Prime. I'd say Beast Wars itself is a much better Transformers show. Whether it's like in the, in the 90s or in the 2000s or in the 2010s. Because it does have so much soul put into it. That's what most of the things nowadays need, soul. So, wait, would you put it in like your top three-ish show or even top one? I'd put it in like a top three because this show along with Animated and Prime are three of my favorite Transformers TV shows of all time. And I'd also put them cool. in my top ten favorite pieces of Transformers media along with uh, the Marvel comics. Uh... The Armada video game, the first movie, Dark of the Moon, the Cybertron games, the War Within comics, and the Devastation game. Epic, yeah. Yeah, like Beast Wars to me is peak Transformer stuff, along with those other examples, because it knows how to do the franchise right. It doesn't use fan service as a way to try and get other people's attention, and more importantly, it knows how to write its characters nicely. <laughs> It's very effective and knows how to win people over. And whether you're a Generation 1 fanboy that only gives a crap about Beast Wars just because it had G1 in it, or you're a 90s kid, or you're someone like me who loves learning about Transformers, Beast Wars is a great show to delve into, especially for the characters. Cool. And finally, we'll be taking a look at the rest of the episodes that have popped up since the pilot for Power Rangers Dino Fury up until the mid-season finale. So, when I first left off on Dino Fury, I thought that what we got was pretty solid for an opening, but I was kind of interested in seeing if we'd either get improvements or the series would be as bad as what I was expecting it to be. But surprisingly, Dino Fury's getting better. Now... It's not mind-blowingly different from what we got with the rest of the Neo Saban era as well as Beast Morphers. It's just that, it, well, like much like with Beast Morphers, it improves on the writing that we had in the past by making the characters seem a little more natural, by having the uh, story feel more serialized, and now making use of the lore, which is always a good thing. But first, let's talk about the individual episodes at the best of my ability. So episode two is when we get to see Zato as well as Ollie and Amelia. I'm presuming that's uh, her name. They become rangers after the initial episode and start learning what it's like to go up against the villains. It's a good opening, like uh, like second, like post pilot episode to start off with, but. I think the more interesting thing is the fact that like uh, Ollie and Amelia are both interested in what Zato has because he's been a ranger for so long. Like and they're like newbies in this sort of situation. And it does alright. The only thing I didn't really like was the fact that uh well, random thought, but it was pretty much when the Rangers like at one point, used a key, or specifically Zato, when he was fighting against uh, one of the monsters, used a gas key, which made like a massive stink bomb attack. And, well, fart jokes in the most recent season of PR haven't been that great. I mean, Megaforce had one with one of the monsters, but only one. Dino Charge had like two. One of them was, was like a dino gas charger and victor monty did plenty in ninja steel which was awful but this one just having one was fine i wasn't that annoyed with it i expected it to be in there since that power up was in real soldier the japanese version 
the more important thing was the fact that like uh that Zato was interested in like going up against the Sporix, but Ollie wanted to help out. And like uh Ollie didn't see the way they initially worked with it, but he understands the fact that there's like uh it's best to work as a team rather than try and use any knowledge that he lacks from his other teammates. So it's pretty much like a typical uh, teamwork story scenario moral of the day, but it's more subtle. It's less like teamwork is always important and you're you're an idiot if you don't have like uh, two other people with you and it's more, hey, let's stick together. Yeah. That makes the difference. Yeah, it is. I mean, Dino Fury is not as slick of storytelling as Dino Thunder, which is also on YouTube right now, and I'm enjoying it more than I am Dino Fury, actually. But it's fine. <laughs> Lost Signal is another episode that involves Zato trying to know how he can reach out to his home planet when he gets a message. And he starts to feel a little doubtful about it. But they are distracted when they start to go up against the likes of a monster that pretty much makes it hard for them to... Like, uh, I think it was, like, fight... Because, like, the monster was sort of like uh, Medusa. Where if, if you see her, you're going to get frozen. So, Zato had to learn a way to fight against the monster without using sight. And he uses, like, a hearing dino key that enhances his ears and allows him to listen his senses while he's fighting. And destroys the device that the Medusa-like monster uses to brainwash people or keep them frozen. That's pretty much it. And when he gets the message, like uh, the moral of the day is that for Zato is that you should that try not to give up too much. You're gonna like put a lot of pressure on yourself. Okay. Yeah, that's pretty much all this is. Like not like it's not like uh, don't give up on yourself too much. Like you got to do this, blah 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 blah. It's more like uh, hey, you got this. Don't let it put yourself down on don't let it put yourself down too much. Episode 4 is where it gets a little more interesting as we have, as Void Knight brings in Boom Tower, who is a chess rook-like monster, but was more of a robot, actually, and he has him go after an orb that actually has two dino keys that are for the soon-to-be Black and Green Rangers, for Javi and Isabella, two siblings who are the uh, children of Sheriff Warden Garcia. And yeah, it's pretty much like a great way for us to be introduced to two new Rangers. Uh, admittedly, Javi is sort of there. He likes music, but not really anything else interesting about him. Whereas Izzy, well, I don't want to get into the characters right away, but I'll just say this Izzy is a mixed bag in terms of her writing. Because on one hand, I like the fact that she has some energy to her, especially since she's the youngest of the Rangers and might be a more of a rookie by comparison. But I don't like the fact that there's certain lines of her that annoy me. Like she says, cringe, but it made me cringe more than it made her cringe. <laughs> uh, she calls Boom Tower a boomer, which, you know, like, okay, that's funny. Uh -oh. Like you pretty much took out the boomer out of boom tower but because i've already heard that joke so much in 2019 it kind of got a little like annoying and definitely shows that the writers are trying to be like how do you do fellow kids yeah and from the new generation gen c baby but it's like it's like they took that writing from 2019 and they made it more like a thing from 20 and they trying to put in, like 2021 tv like how does that work it's just as like annoying as the old style of impact font memes. But <laughs> at least her introduction exactly. fight at least her introduction fight with uh Javi was pretty good. I'll say this right off the bat, the fight choreography for Dino Fury is very nice. It's all it's like it, since it has like the guy that did the fight choreography for the Disney era, the best era, in my opinion. The fights feel so much more powerful, the Rangers feel more alive in their fights. Like, 
Tokusatsu nowadays relies so heavily on all these flashy backgrounds and all these flashy finishers and armor that like envel- that develops around them and makes them even clunkier. It like it, back then it seemed kind of cool, but over time it just got so so dull. So seeing characters fight with the Disney style song choreography is just very nice, and it makes and it definitely puts the power in Power Rangers, as Dawson Rider once said. Yeah. I especially like when Izzy used like a training pole and had like the sword hooked around it so she can use the weapon both as a staff and as like using a sword on the end of it so she can swing it around and attack her enemies. Okay, so they have their own techniques and styles. Yeah, it definitely gives them a little more to work with. And mm-hmm. considering how dull the fights have been for the Neo Saban era, where it's pretty much like typical sword fights, and the occasional like uh, martial arts type fights that the actors try their best to do, but real talk, the problem was that mm-hmm. like with the, with the original MMPR style of martial arts, they had actual... Uh, like martial artists involved training the actors to become martial artists and as a result that's why MMPR has like very good fights compared to the Jewel Ranger stuff and that's also why uh, Jungle Fury had as, like as, like much like the rest of the Disney era had very good stunt choreography whether it's from flips that feel epic or attacks that feel much more strong or much stronger by comparison it makes the Neo Saban era feel so reliant on flashy power ups and huge stock footage blast effects that it just seems kind of dragging. But at least Dino Fury knows how to work on that in the same way Beast Morphers did, but using more of the proper sun choreography that Beast Morphers was lacking in some areas. Cool. Yeah, that's pretty much all for episode four. Episode five, uh, Izzy is pretty much sort of doubtful about how she can, like, uh, I think it's like apologize to, like, this sort of uh, special eds kid who, actually, I think the idea is, like, for her to try and, like, learn how to, like, know what it's like to try and be in, like, a missing, like, a training session as well as uh, be involved with help and the like. It's, like, it's kind of like a clunky episode, if you ask me, for episode five. Like, it's not bad or anything. It's just... I get what they're going for, but it just seems a little kind of, yeah. Episode six. It's kind of plain. It's like, don't give, it's like, uh, it's like uh, involving like how, like you shouldn't always let winning be the thing for you and trying to like focus on some important stuff. Kind of reminds you of Dino Thunder. Just watching the third episode of Dino Thunder on YouTube where uh, Connor starts to feel doubtful about being a ranger when he wants to be a soccer player. And but at least with the episode, like the interactions were more natural. Like Connor just felt a little more natural with his doubt in becoming a ranger, whereas Izzy sort of immediately lost her like wittiness. And like it's just kind of weird. I think it's like trying to rewrite a character for the sake of a story. I don't know. I mean, if if like Amelia can uh, be a ranger while still working for Buzz Blast, the uh, BuzzFeed type news company, then why can't Izzy f- have the same level of confidence? And speaking of Amelia, she in episode, I think six, uh, starts to feel doubtful about the fact that she's going down with bad luck, and like, uh, she doesn't want to help out the Rangers because she thinks she'll harm them as a result, but st- st- there's one thing that she learns about luck, it's the fact that uh, she really shouldn't try and let it put herself down too much. It's just like her focus that's sort of like what's putting her down instead of the actual bad luck. Like her self-esteem. Yeah, China. that's what it is. That's what it is. And that's also another good moral that Dino Fury has. It's not just like, uh, it's not like, oh, don't like, uh, don't do bad things. It's all just like, hey, don't let this uh, mess you up, buddy. You got this. It's like encouragement. Ooh. It's like, it's like mm-hmm. when they like beat their chest a bit with their right arm on their heart, and they point at you with full on confidence in you, because they know for a fact so, that you can like, do something like the that. Wolf of Wall Street. Yeah, in a way, <laughs> that's very good. Like, like I said, I also like the fact that like uh, 
when, on a side note, I like the fact that Amelia doesn't immediately fight in her civilian form. She when she sees one of the mo- like the Sporex beasts, she immediately decides, okay, I'm going to morph, and she does morph. Episode seven is another like sort of meh episode because Javi's dad, Sheriff slash Warden Garcia, uh, shows up and like tells Javi, hey, where did you get that guitar from? Uh, like, give me that thing. Like, you're wasting money, dude. And, like, that's kind of annoying because, like, Kavi, I don't know how old Kavi is, but I think he's older than his sister. But more importantly, he can probably live on his own because he seems more, like, independent, yet he gets his stuff taken away. Kind of annoying, if you ask me. And as a result of yeah. him losing doubt, he might feel a little, like, discouraged from being involved with the mission. But he pretty much needs to understand how to try and like open up about his feelings so he can help get the Zord. Which is alright, but it's kind of a... Uh, I, I don't really see much of what they're going for. Plus, it is kind of annoying when they like... Uh, like uh, Sheriff Warden Garcia pretty much shows up and says, Hey, no music in the, like, the bird area. Like he, like he could have said, okay, let's move somewhere else before... His dad stopped him and took his guitar away. Kind of meh. But episode eight is where things get a little more interesting because this is the part where we get the return of Mick Kanick from Ninja Steel, who, despite Ninja Steel being my least my least favorite ever Power Ranger season because I absolutely hate its quality <laughs> and its storytelling, Mick was a bright spot and more importantly was a nice addition to Dino Fury. He shows up asking the Rangers if they can help him or he can help them. Uh, Zato says, no, we have our other problems. But it turns out at one point that, like, uh, Mick is looking for the Nexus Prism because Mick is trying to, like, connect with other Rangers as he's somewhat of, like, a messenger type of guy. Because for those that don't know, Power Rangers is a massive world, and while they may replace Rangers almost every year or so, their history is at least kept track of. Because, oh man, when the Nexus Prism returns to in front of Zato and the team, they realize just the importance of its history. Because, as it turns out, the Morphin Masters were involved with creating it. They created the Dino Gems for Dino Thunder, as well as the Ender Gems for Dino Charge. And some of the people might be wondering, wait a second, like what would those have in common with like the like the Morphin Masters? Well, like the Morphin Masters are the power source of the Power Rangers universe all over the world, or like the multiverse rather. So you can imagine them putting these in different worlds. Like maybe the Energems were sent to another planet or another universe rather. Because Dino Charge is in a separate sort of timeline from everything else, like Mighty Morphin through most of the Caesar. Through most of the season. Let me rephrase it again. Because Dino Charge in this is because Dino Charge is in a separate world from Mighty Morphin, Dino Thunder, and so on and so forth. And it makes you wonder actually, how do they handle the other Dino powers? Or more importantly, the rest of the powers for the Rangers, because some of them didn't really use the Morphin grid. Or rather, the Morphin Masters. Rather, they're maybe not their, not maybe not get the help from them specifically, but more so like get some sort of inspiration or help from them because some are more tech based than others in terms of range of powers. It all varies from universe to universe, or in this case, team to team. I don't know where the universe part came from. Although actually, like maybe they got some sort of inspiration, but actually, never never mind. RPM is different from everyone else. Like. Uh, Dr. K made those powers herself, not the Morphin Masters. Okay. So, this is the first, let's say, connected episode with all the other Power Rangers series or lore? It's one of the many, actually. Because sometimes oh. they make crossovers. But this is, like, I think... One where it explains the source of the powers because, like, there's always been some sort of assumptions that some artifacts were used by a specific group of people. 
But Dino Fury established that something like the Dino Gems and the Inner Gems were made by the Morphin Masters because the Morphin Masters created the Morphin Grid. They made Dino Fury the first ever Power Rangers team, as we retroactively find out. Although that doesn't me immediately make Mighty Morphin like uh, like some sort of downfall. Like much like when I mentioned about Optimus Primal doing even more than Optimus Prime, Hasbro made sure not to like downplay MMPR because I know the fact that the average '90s boomer or '90s fanboy would think that MMPR is the best one ever, and if they find out that Dino Fury came first in terms of storytelling, they're going to get pissed off. So they made sure to say that Dino Fury is the first ever known team on Earth, whereas MMPR is the first known publicly announced or publicly aware team. It is what it is. But the more surprising thing is the fact that Void Knight, who was one of the main villains of the season, actually has a wife who needs a Sporex Beast to revive her. And if you actually saw the episode, you might think that the footage or the scene of it might seem a little familiar if you happen to be a DC fan. Oh. It's basically Mr. Freeze. Oh. Yeah. They did a copycat? Well, it's inspired by it because honestly, <laughs> as much as I like to like, uh, like be, like roll my eyes whenever I think of how people Dick Wright, Batman the Animated Series, because it's the one people talk about. It's like one that set the bar high. I will say that Mr. Freeze is one of my favorite things about it because they know how to write the character. They gave him a much more interesting backstory. He's more than just ice puns. He's he's got layers to him. And yeah. seeing Void Knight have inspiration from the Mr. Freeze we all know about from the animated series, the more recent comics, the Arkham stuff. It's just, that's how you do Mr. Freeze, right? And it's also how you do an interesting villain because I know most villains had tragic backstories, but I like the fact that Void Knight isn't just some sort of evil Power Ranger. He's also got a reason to use the Sporex Beast in his own favor. And that's pretty much all I have to say about the episodes. So, what do I think about Dino Fury right now? It's alright. I'm not 100% mind-blown still by the series overall. Like, I'm more, like, I think some of its parts is better than the sum of its whole. But that doesn't mean that Dino Fury is a crappy show so far. I just think that there's still better that I'm waiting for from Hasbro. And I know for a fact that, okay, sure, people are going to be interested in stuff like uh, the Easter eggs or when they have stuff like, uh, a like a special needs kid be a focus. And when they talk about the one of the female rangers ripping off her skirts just because she doesn't like skirts, that's what gets people's attention. But for me, I want to see more storytelling that's much more refined. On the same level as the Disney era, if not better. And hopefully we get that after Dino Fury. But actually, were you aware of the fact that the Green Ranger ripped off her skirt? Because there was originally a skirt that she ripped off eventually because she doesn't like skirts. Huh. Sort of like women empowerment in their, for the clothings like that. Well, pretty much like... In Japan, the Green Ranger was a male, and Hasbro decided to make the Green Ranger a female, which, you know, is fine. But you, like the, what, the, like what annoyed me more than Izzy's character was the way the Toku fan base lost their shit over the scene. There are so many people that overanalyze it by saying, Oh, like, oh my god, this like shatters sexist archetypes. This makes Dino Fury the number one best season ever. And there's some people that say, oh, why would you want to make the scene like that? Like, this is a female character. Her body frame's different from Rio Sol Green. Blah, blah, blah. It's like, Jesus Christ, guys. I don't want to hear you guys, like, bitch about someone analyzing something like Spider-Man 3 or Batman v Superman or Dark of the Moon. Because if it's wrong to, an to analyze stuff like that, and it's also wrong to analyze 
a simple scene of a Power Ranger ripping off a skirt that she didn't like. Literally, yeah, the scene I think it's was, superficial. Literally, the scene was much briefer than all the, the dumbass Toku Twitter threads <laughs> about what Power Rangers should and shouldn't do with the suits. Like, who cares about what the Sentai did? I'd rather they make their own stuff, or at least like uh, do no Sentai footage and just make their own shows. Because I don't want to have topics like this from the fan base. They act like they care about all this sort of like concerns. And then <clears throat> they like go mind blown for simple scenes like that. And they want us to feel ashamed of doing these other realizations of things that are more worthy of it. Like I don't I don't really have any interest in wanting to deal with the hypocrisy of the Toku fan base, especially when they are the same people that would say stuff like, Oh, like oh, oh this season a common writer, like don't criticize it, it's just for kids. It's like, just turn off your brain and enjoy it. Because there are things that are worth complaining about. It also reminds me when uh, people were going crazy against those that even didn't have that many big complaints about the other Dino season, Dino Charge. Where pretty much, if you said at least one negative thing, but still like the season overall, they'd go after you and say, uh, like, rot in hell for insulting Chip Lynn. It's like, come on now. Yeah, yeah. But I think that's all I'd say about Dino Fury. It, it, like, I still think it's going to take a lot more than just Easter eggs and uh, skirt removals to try and win me over. But that being said, I can't really say that Dino Fury has a lot of bright spots in it. And honestly, I think there's more to enjoy from it than this Japanese counterpart, Rio Soldier, because Rio Soldier is just only good if you're interested in, like, a big, flashy Super Sentai season with no real, like, uh, balance in terms of character development aside from whatever they do with Gai Soul or what they do with that Red Senshi uh, and the like. But beyond the sort of, like, uh, attempts at trying to give it some mythology, Rio Soldier is kind of real soul basic, whereas Dino Fury, not as good as Disney era or in space or Time Force and Wild Force, but it is serviceable. I'd say it does things better than Beast Morphers right now, but we'll see if the rest of the season does any better. And we're going to revisit it at some point. So that's pretty much all I have to say for Dino Fury. Great. And that concludes for this episode. Next time you'll see us, we'll be taking a look at, well... Similar themes as well, because we're going to be taking a look at another zombie movie that involves uh, Zack Snyder as its director. We'll also be having a sequel to Beast Wars, and we'll also be having another dino theme season that's fairly recent, that being Dino Charge. So don't forget to have us review that, as well as Beast Machines and Army of the Dead next time we meet. See you guys. Until next time, take care.